Do we have anyone else showing up, Kevin? No, I think that's it. Um, I'm glad. Uh, uh, I'm here. Rebecca's um, out in the audience right now. Oh, cool. Oh. So. Oh, just... hold on. I'll um, I'll ask if she can be brought up. Uh, what's uh, is is she there under her? Yeah, it's a name. Uh, yeah, there she is. Hey, fantastic! Glad you could make it. Thank you. All right. Why don't we get started? Um, hi, um, my name. Um, he, him, um, and we're here today to watch some clips of uh, Trans Geek and also to um, engage in some discussion around trans. Um, so um, I thought it's probably best to let the other uh, panelists um, uh, introduce themselves. So um, why don't we start with... Hi, my name is Mallory Wood. Um, I am, a, I, I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a trans woman living in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, clinical social worker, dabbler in a lot of geek fandoms. Uh, not really up to date in any of them ever. So don't don't ask me about the latest shit because I'm not going to know. Um, <laughs> but I'll opine anyway. Don't worry. Um, yeah, that's enough for me. Uh, Sit. Want to introduce yourself? I think you're muted, Sarah. Yep. Check your mind. Oh, there you go. Yes, there you go. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Can't um, hear you. Yeah, while uh, while Sayers uh, working on, don't we uh, have uh, Janelle? Hi, I'm Janelle Jakeways, um, career game developer in both uh, tabletop and uh, video games. Um, I've been doing this since the mid '70s, um, and I use she/her pronoun pronouns, and I'm uh, based in the Dallas, Texas area. And Rebecca? I'm Rebecca Heinemann. Um, you may know me as the woman in uh, that Netflix special called um, High Score. I'm the very first video game champion in 1980, won Space Invaders, then was became a found, one of the founders of Interplay Productions and have been doing video game development ever since. Okay. Um, you get it? Have your uh, mic uh, sorted there? Yes, it sounds like it. Hmm. Okay. Uh, say your word. Yeah, I can barely. Trouble with your, we can just barely hear you. Um, So um, let me, I'll introduce Sayer. We'll try to uh, fix what's what's going on uh, when we uh, show the clip. Uh, Sayer, um, he, him pronouns, is um, the executive director of the Metropolitan Trans Umbrella Group in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, Sayer is a activist and father, um, a burner and, um, one of the co-producers of the film with myself and um, I thought um, we could um, go on, look at a clip from the film. It's about uh, 12 minutes. Um, and while we're doing that, we'll try to get uh, Sayer in on the conversation here. All right. Give me a second. Um, um, I need to uh, get the... And this should do it. The internet. 
changed everything. My first lifelines, my first community were, you know, weird people on the internet who had no idea. Can you hear me? I'll say something. ways. Most of the people who believe uh, strongly in meritocracy
another clip lined up, Kevin, or are we talking? <laughs> You're muted. Kevin, we can't hear you. I can't hear you. I hear you either, Kevin. I think you got to turn your mic back on. It's marked. As, there we go. There we go. Muted. Uh, check your mic. <laughs> <laughs> On the screen, there should be something that says mic on to the right of it is an up triangle. Look at that triangle yeah. to see if it's actually getting input from your microphone. Come on. Oh, wait, I heard you say, come on, Kevin. All right, great. Uh, just switch microphones. Um, okay. Um, so anyways, I thought we um, could start uh, the discussion um, maybe with uh, Mal. Uh, you uh, wanted you just to get cut out again. The oh, there we go. What was <laughs> the first part of your question, Kevin? Uh, why it was that you wanted to get involved in the film? Well, Kevin, you know I love you, so that was part of it. Um, I, I, um, you know, I, I thought it was interesting. I thought it's an interesting question. I still think it's an interesting question of why are there so many trans geeks? And I know that's kind of the, that was that was the entry point for you too. Um, I still think it's an interesting question. Um, and so I wanted to explore it. You know, I also, I also wanted to, to keep you in line, um, <laughs> make sure, and make sure <laughs> that, you know, the representation in the, in the film was, was good. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I was, I, that was not, you know, that was not the selling point for me. Right. I mean, the selling point for me was like, I'm, I'm genuinely curious. I was genuinely curious. I still am genuinely curious why there's, why there are so many trans geeks. What is it about, the cultures, if you can consider them cultures, right? I mean, that's a question um, uh, that of, of trans trans culture, geek culture that that resonate with each other, right? Um, and I, I can opine on that um, at length, but I, I think that um, I think to me, there's this fundamental question of, uh, or this fundamental idea of difference embedded in both cultures, right? I mean, there's not much that holds geeks together other than interests that are sort of deemed, you know, uh, alternative in, in some way, you know, geeky. I mean, it's this, it's a very nebulous label. Like what, what holds comics and gaming and, and, and anime and car and cartoons and what, what, what hold what holds all this together? I, I honestly don't know other than that. These are interests that have sort of been subjugated, um, to a certain extent. Um, and I think there's a parallel in queer culture, right? I mean, I don't know really what holds queer and trans um, culture together and, you know, and, and other sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, sexual and gender subcultures that, that like, you know, polyculture, kink culture, et cetera. What, what holds that together under one umbrella other than difference, right? Um, and so that's that's the theme that I see, right? Um, and, and I have a lot of questions about that theme. You know, I, I think there's um, there's this idea, um, and it's a good idea that that difference is good, right? The difference is is something we need to value and appreciate and 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 promote. Um, uh, and I, I I agree with that. Um, I also think that the sort of the queer um, moment, right? The, the queer theory moment in LGBTQIA and the letters go on culture, um, 
was saying, okay, so it's not just a matter of like difference is good, difference is valuable. It's a matter of saying, okay, what is, how is difference defined and how does that intersect with um, currents of power in our society, right? Like what makes something different? And um, I think geek culture, I mean, this is at this point, this is me um, pontificating, but I think geek culture has to have that moment too. And it is to some extent. Uh, of, of not just saying, you know, okay, d difference is good, but but what what makes difference, right? Like what what creates that dynamic in the first place? How is it related to systems of power, and 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 how do we divest from or, or resist those systems of power, um, and to the to the extent that they hurt people, you know? So so that's my lengthy answer to that question. <laughs> okay. Um... I was wondering, uh, Janelle, do you have, um, you um, have a lot of experience in content um, um, creation, uh, going back mm -hmm. to your your um, Dungeons and Dragons um, modules that you did. Um, yes. And I was wondering if you could give us a um, perspective on how that's changed over over the years of your participation in um, gaming in the industry, and how you how you see that now. Um, let's see. From where from starting out, um, a lot of my you know nerd identity was involved in escapism. Um, so we're going back to going into science fiction and fantasy, we were going into these worlds that were our safe spaces. Um, they were places where we could experience other people's lives, experience being heroes, um, and we could be whoever we wanted to be in our minds. Um, that was true with comic books and reading. And then when games came along, it allowed some people who had um, who could be in comfortable environments because a lot of us didn't have those um, safe game group experiences, um, but we could try and be someone else. And being trans and pretty much being in denial about it most of my life, um, I still found ways to work that identity into content, but not be overt about it. Um, in some of my first published works, I would have characters who were, oh gosh, what, multiple expressions? I guess that's the way to say. There's a, there was a spell in D&D &D called Magic Jar, and what it allowed what to take, was allowed someone to put their soul or their essence of being into an object and then go from that into other bodies. Now, to be honest, it's an evil thing because you're taking control of other people's bodies. They're not, they're, they're still there. You're still, when they, when you leave, they're still there. So you're, um, you're kind of riding on other people's lives, but it was an idea of experiencing being male, experiencing being female and, and, how would you do that? And as a game, in the sense, this was a bad guy in one of my adventures. Um, how would a game master express that when interacting with the players? And as we go forward in time, um, a lot forward in time, um, to when I finally transitioned, I actually, in my writing, I'm now including people who are um, transgender, who um, aren't straight in their their relationships and just presenting it honestly not trying to point it that somebody and, and make an example of it or make them the bad guy or make them a victim they're just another character you encounter and my idea is is i'm trying to make people feel comfortable with that yeah i'm trying to normalize that i'll, I'll say that I'm trying to normalize players and game masters feeling comfortable meeting, part, uh, expressing people who are different from themselves. 
So it's interesting that you talk about normalizing that um, because we have a question about um, both cisnormativity and um, reinforcing existing gender uh, gender spaces. Um, does anyone want to jump in here um, and talk uh, talk about um, certainly when we started um, the film and in my ignorance, um, I was initially approaching the film with sort of like the lens of um, sort of like the binary fallacy. Um, and it's through education of the film and talking to people at events like FlameCon and GamerX um, that I was educated and, you know, experienced um, a more expansive um, tapestry, whatever you want, whatever you want to uh, want to call it. Um, I think that's something that maybe the film um, is not so great at bringing out. I think maybe we are in the film um, sort of maybe even reinforcing um, that the the binary. I'm going to come in and jump in and say, when you were producing the film, and it's been a few years since you started and actually the arc that it took you to complete it, I don't think outside of, deep, if, let's say, if you weren't deep inside um, trans or queer culture, you weren't as aware of non-binary. And in the last few years, we've become increasingly aware of it to the point that we're starting to actually even in even in you know cis culture acknowledge that it exists that we aren't that this there's there's this binary at one pole at one end and there's a you know another at the other end but in between we're a combination of it all or none at all and we're just starting to become aware of that and finding ways to express it in our own culture. I mean, I, I think so too. I mean, I, I think that, you know, um, there's there's been an arc in terms of our culture, in terms of accepting and, and realizing and, and paying any attention whatsoever to, to non-binary identity. I, I think there's also been it's it's an interesting arc though, right? Because there has been discussion and acknowledgement of non identity from the get go. I mean, it's been it's been here, right? I mean, it's not new, right? Maybe the the, the social awareness of it, right? The, the 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 common cognizance of it is new, um, and and maybe the terminology is new too, right? I mean that that um, the terminology shifts constantly, um, in um, in in really any culture, but um, particularly, I think this one. Um, but um, but it, again, I think it, to me, it speaks to, um, you know, there's always this question of like what, you know, the, the question of what is, so not to go back to the thing that I was harping on earlier, but the, the question of what is different is um, in itself, I think, especially for geek culture, a like it's not it's not a it's not just a question of like what is subaltern, what is like subjugated, but what difference is acceptable to to um, to express, right? I mean, um, I, and I think we see this really well illustrated in in geek culture that there's certain kinds of difference that it's acceptable to express, and certain kinds of difference that it's not. Um, uh, and, and that changes over time, right? I mean, that's, I think that's why we see such a, we see so many trans people in geek culture, um, because it provides that escapism, that fantasy, that, that embrace, that the, the embracing of like, of difference and of embodying different, um, identities and the ones that are sort of allowed or allotted to you. Um, 
But there's also this very strong pushback from within geek community and has been for a long time of, of people in the, the programmer culture that Rebecca talked about, you know, it, in Gamergate that I talked about in the film. And, and, you know, people who are saying, oh, my, my identity, my identity as a geek as a nerd is based on difference, right? But it's, it's the right kind of difference, right? I mean, it's, it's the okay kind. It's the kind where I, I like to, you know, to kill orcs, but, um, but you can't, <laughs> you know, um, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a resonance there. Um, and, in in those, I, uh, in those ideas, like it's it, the, the idea of what's normal is, is politically structured, but so is the idea of what's different and can be different, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, it, there's, Gatekeeping has many dimensions, um, and you know we we see it in all sorts of fandoms. Um, you know, do you you know do you know you know this um, esoteric fact about um, you know the work the workings of the Death Star in, in Star Wars or the um, you know the matter antimatter warp drives in, in Star Trek, et cetera. Um, you know, it's almost like you have to pass a quiz. Um, one thing that I was in, uh, was interested in is Rebecca, um, in the movie you talk about um, trying to bring women characters into some of the earlier video games. And I was wondering if you could talk about your your self knowledge and how that affected your efforts within the within the industry. Um, well, the issue is that I've been in the industry for a very very long time, and back in the <coughs> excuse me, back in <clears throat> back in the eighties, um, there was a very very um, strong culture that only boys played video games. If an example is like if you look at photos of the 1980 Atari Space Invaders champion, you'd hardly find any girls playing. Um, you see rows and rows of boys um, competing in the contest. And unfortunately, that reinforced the stereotype so that when game developers saw that mostly boys showed up at the events, they then started making games for boys. But that caused a vicious circle because what really happened was that there was a lot of girls who played video games, but when they asked to go to these conventions, the uh, parents would say, oh, no, you can't go, but little Timmy can go, uh, <clears throat> which, of course, hid all the women who actually were playing games. Um, like an example, when Bard's Tale 3 was released, the game sold really, really well, and one of the first things that people were um, talking about in the reviews were saying, finally, I can play... <clears throat> Uh, character as me, um, you know, in other words, as a girl. Um, or in some cases, some boys would like to role play as girls. There's nothing wrong with that. But the very fact that at least the option was there. Um, now, as time went on, more and more women found a voice, um, especially during the time during both Doom and Quake, in which clans are formed by women. And they were formidable. And it started gaining slowly that women are equals to men in the gaming field only until like right now we still have a way to go i mean we're not complete you know we don't we haven't earned res full respect yet but we're so much farther along than we were back in the 80s and 90s yeah um i think that's true i think the pace of change um, has really accelerated, um, of late. Um, we actually started, or I actually started, um, filming for this in 2011, 2012. Um, and as a result, I think there are parts of the, there are parts of the film that feel dated now. Um, and there has been a lot of a lot of change. There's also a lot of difference across culture. Um, you, um, for instance, um, I conducted a couple of interviews in uh, the UK, um, and 
the term transvestite does not have the pejorative weight that it does here, or rather it is acquiring that pejorative weight, but only in the last few years. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I only dealt with, you know, English speaking uh, Northern Hemisphere uh, countries for the most part in the in the film. Um, so, you know, every every film there needs to be some sort of uh, some sort of scope. Um, would have loved to do cosplay. Would have loved to do fan fiction, um, but there was there's not room for everything in the film. Uh, people don't want to uh, wait uh, sit through more than ninety minutes. Uh, but you know, there are whole other films, and also you could make the whole film over again and it would be very different, I think. You could say that in game development. Like if I was to reimagine any of my previous games, I would have changed a lot of things in many cases because the times have changed. And things that were like, well, if I put that in the game, um, it would immediately be pulled from shelves to like, okay, so you got a gay character, so what? You know, things have changed. I mean, I think we had a lot of, in making the film, I, I, there are parts of it that feel dated. There's, there's parts of it that feel skewed or, you know, ba definitely biased based on the people that we were able to interview and get in touch with and who were, but, uh, you know, it's interesting too, it wasn't just our editing that um, that did that, right? I mean, it wasn't just the, the, the availability of people that did that. Um, it was also self-editing based on threats. We had people, we really good interviews that I would have loved to keep in the movie drop out entirely because they were receiving threats um, and they were receiving- Fantastic stuff. Yeah, I mean, really good, really good stuff that we would have loved to have in there, but, um, you know, they, they were receiving backlash on the internet and they didn't want to, they didn't want to be more publicized than they already were. I mean, the, which, um, I don't know, it, it, it speaks to the sort of ubiquity um, of, you know, of, of how, you know, even in, in media that is really like explicitly pro trans, right. And explicitly like, um, pro queer, it, you know, n not only do the makers sort of, um, you know, blind spots get, get, um, get pushed in there. Um, but, but the society finds its way in like these, 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 these currents of, 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 of oppression in our society and find their way in through these weird nooks and crannies that you wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise expect. And I mean, um, you know, even as 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 Mal said, you know, people were worried for their safety, and other people were worried for you know their um, um, their profession. Um, one person had to pull pull out of the film because when the film started um, going around um, film festivals, um, they were looking for employment and they were worried what what participating in the film might mean to their employment prospects um and you know this is this is only three years ago um so you know a lot has changed a lot hasn't yeah but the irony is this is that if you were in the film and some future employers saw you and then discriminated against on you isn't that would, that would kind of be a hint? You really wouldn't want to be employed by them, anyways. Would be employed, you know. Bottom line, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but would you want to be employed with a sword of Damocles over your head, knowing that at any time your secret is out, that you're unemployed again? Yeah, no, I mean. But, but Go ahead. I was going to say that I know that when I came out, um, 
I did explore the idea, at least in my head, of hiding my identity. But my problem was at the time I was employed, I was working for a company that had a presence in both the tabletop game industry and the video game industry. And there was no way that I was going to come out in that environment and not have the rest of the world know about it. So I just said, day one, once I'm ready to, once I'm ready to launch Janelle, we're from, it's totally Janelle, totally public totally honest about who I am. And I will say that for me, that was the absolute correct choice. There's a theme we explore in the movie. I don't know if you're planning on, on showing clips that, that covered it, Kevin, but, um, but the sort of double-edged nature of, of visibility, the, 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 um, it was something, um, that was talked about that I talked about in the film at least. Um, you know, cause, um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's something that we need. It's, it's something, it's something that as a movement, as a society, as a culture, we, we need to, um, to, to normalize, to, to make ourselves known, to make ourselves understood, um, to have any, you know, um, recognition, much, much less res respect, um, um, but, but it's also, you know, it's, it's a, it's a literally dangerous thing, right? I mean, not, not just in terms of employment, in terms of our, our, our physical safety, even in this, this day and age, I'm, you know, I'm not out at work. I'm not so not out at work that I'm not talking at this convention. <laughs> I'm not, so I'm not out at work that my name isn't attached to this, to this project, but I don't, I don't talk about it with my, my coworkers and I, and not out of fear that I would be, um, hurt, not out of fear that I would be, um, uh, fired, but just because it's, it's, you know, I think it's, it's critical to, to note that even in this age of like increasing visibility, increasing acceptance, it isn't, it's, it's very difficult, um, to, to deal <laughs> with being, you know, openly and visibly trans, um, and, um, in your workplace and society and in, in, in general. And, and so that visibility aspect, I mean, I, I know a lot of um, people who, who feel really, really complicated about the, the fact that we often push towards visibility when visibility, um, you know, literally puts us in danger, you know, too. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a hard uh, needle to thread. And I think that's one of the things, there is a line that I have, drawn in my life and online behind a video camera through my work i'm comfortable expressing being transgender um i'm comf i have to deal with the fact that my dead name is on a lot of my older works and that most of that will never change but on the street in a restaurant um the most that I express in my life is that I'm gay because I'm out there with my wife um, and I don't make a big deal about it. So in a sense, I'm visible and visible. Um, and I'm, that is a privilege. I mean, despite being over six, six foot four and over 300 pounds, I'm still fairly invisible. So I have that privilege. Um, not everyone does. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. Um, we are um, out of time, according to the clock. Um, I had other clips that I wanted to show, but given the um, problems I was ha I was having with my computer locking up during the video playback, um, I think it was better just to uh, continue the, the discussion. Um, unfortunately, uh, Sayer had some stuff to say, but um, he lost power. <laughs> So um, I want to thank everyone. Um, I want to thank all the uh, people that have been uh, talking in the chat. Um, I'll drop a link in the chat um, for uh, the website um, where for a limited time you can watch the whole movie. Um, I think in about uh, 45 days we're going to be uh, distributing 
Um, at that point, the free screener will go away, but I don't want anyone to not see the film because of their finances. So um, if you don't get to see the film in 45 days, you can always contact me and I can get you a code to see it for free. Kevin, I'm seeing from Steph here, we've got, you know, we've got a few minutes left, so there's time oh, okay. to answer the okay. from the Q&A if we want to answer those first. Um, there are yeah. a couple. Um, yep. Can I, can I just launch into that? Yep, go for it. So the first one is, do you think it's easier for trans and non-binary people um, to produce fan fiction and or cosplay versus video games because of how respected gaming is? Um, I... I I'm not sure exactly what the the definition of respected there is, but I'm but I'm um, maybe more like mainstream, more more corporatized. I'm I'm not sure exactly. I, I wonder if anyone has thoughts about that. Well, from a commercial standpoint, you're usually in gaming. You're usually restricted to design by committee. Um, and design by committee means the committee of this. You know your the committee of the shareholders. Uh, so a lot, they want to, for the most part, they want to be mainstream. They want to they want to appeal to what they think is the broadest possible audience. And there's still a lot of them are still thinking in terms of the broadest possible audience is males between the ages of 13 and 30. Um, as far as producing more um, trans, non-binary, queer content, that tends to fall in the lap of the ind independent developers, very small people who don't have to worry about large budgets and can create games that make it a breakout following and go huge and tell a story that other people aren't hearing. There's a, another question in the Q&A. Uh, what are your favorite games that are queer inclusive currently available? Um, I'm going to bow out of this one because um, with my life situation right now, I am not doing a whole lot of gaming. I had to drop out of the uh, gaming group that I was doing uh, every Saturday. Um, and fortunately, that was a very... Um, very male group, a lot of testosterone in the in that group. Um, so, uh, if anyone else wants to make some suggestions, I mean, I'm like, I'm thinking like life is strange, but that's going back what like seven years now. Um. Just uh, I did a remaster of Life is Strange one and two and Before the Storm, and so I know I worked on the remix. Um, but uh, yeah, those are very, very good games. Another one I would like to suggest is the Borderlands series. They're very inclusive in their characters and uh, character creation. I really, I love that you shouted them out. Um, they're, they're just wildly um, immature and also like on the level at the same time. It's very fun. It's, it's, that's me. Um, so, uh, I love them. I also, um, I want to shout out, um, Dishonored, Death of the Outsider was a good one. I know this is behind, but I, I also, like I told you at the beginning, I'm like several years behind on everything. Um, Dishonored, Death of the Outsider was amazing. It had a, um, a queer black woman as the main character, um, which you don't see in AAA video games at all. Um, and, um, uh, I would also... Can I just, I want to shout out tabletop gaming, right? Because you can do it there, right? You can do anything the fuck you want in tabletop gaming. I have a, I have a, a, a game of like, um, fifth edition D and D going right now, um, where everybody at the table is queer except the DM. And I, I honestly, like, he, I'm just waiting for him to come out. Um, so, so, so like, um, I think yeah, you can do you can do anything there. I mean, I and I think that's like that's so valuable. It, it is in person role playing. Like, is that collaborative storytelling model is so critical to me, right? Because you don't. It's not. It's not about marketing. I mean, there's a marketing component to making the game, but when you make, you you make your own story, right? So, um, I want to give out. A, I should also, since we're talking about tabletop, give a shout out to both. Uh, Wizards of the Coast 
and to Paizo for uh, DAD 5E and uh, Pathfinder, because they've both been making an effort to be more inclusive of non cisgender, non heterosexual characters in their game, I mean, be accommodating for it. Um, Paizo has even made some trans um, iconic characters um, in their games. Um, I think there's even one in Magic the Gathering, one of the, um, the hero characters. I don't play card games. So, but, the, and then I know from personal, you know, my friends, there are a lot of uh, non binary, trans, gay people working at both companies um, making those games. Content too. I'm just going to chat. Look, this is Fairy Fire. It's a, a um, kickstarted um, uh, expansion. But I mean, it's, it's just it's a supplemental material for 5e that it is, it is trans and queer as fuck, and it's all about um, the Fey Wild, and and it was it's it's great. I mean, there's uh, like that goes back to the earlier question, the two of like cosplay and and fanfic. I mean, yeah, I mean the the stuff that's self generated, you have room, you know, to do whatever you want. Um, and, and, you know, we're getting to the point where we can fund hardcover supplemental materials that also, you know, that are there. Um, we're, we're almost done. Um, but I, I do want to say, Kevin, did you, did you post the link to the, the film anywhere? Did you? I got the, uh, post, a li uh, post a link to the website. There will be a free screener there within the hour. Um, and Great. You, there'll be a link on the, uh, on the top of the uh, front page. Cool. Um, I'm also just going to hang out in like the first floor lobby somewhere. My name is Mallory Wood. Again, I mean, you can see it right here, but um, uh, if you, if you want to chat um, for a little, at least a little bit, I'm just drinking mimosas at home. Um, so if you want, if you want to talk about trans culture and geek culture, um, I'm, I'm here for it. Yeah. I can join you down there. All right. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, and um, Thank you to the uh, FlameCon staff. Um, FlameCon is awesome. I've been in person live, uh, in person twice, and once virtually, um, and it's one of my favorite cons. Anyways, thanks to the staff, and uh, thank you, Janelle. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Mal, and thanks to Sayer in um, in in um, absence. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody.